Water has always been a region of conflicting viewpoints. For some, it means freedom, a new start. To others, a means of protection, a wall to keep others out. Just over my shoulder is Mexico. Freedom or protection, the South Texas border to this day holds legendary status across the U.S. Dangerous and renegade are words associated with the region. But do those words truly describe the U.S.-Mexico border? My name is Nick Maddox, and I've adopted South Texas as my home. With all the media attention our area receives, it's time to find out the real story. What is the history of our region? And what more is there to tell? Traveling from Laredo, to the Gulf of Mexico, we find a mixture of cultures, values, and stories. Many of these stories are rooted in tradition and told often. Lately, though, I've heard whispers of a story known by few and seldom told. Our story, rooted in pre-Civil War Texas, influences life along the border and across the U.S. today. Armed with new research and information, I decided to take a trip across South Texas and uncover the hidden story of this area's link to the Underground Railroad. Throughout this journey, I will speak with community leaders, ranchers, and historians to find out how a ferry ride to freedom altered the course of U.S. history. When we talk about South Texas, we're talking Laredo to Brownsville, Texas. And when we talk about the valley, the area is right here along the Rio Grande River. Before discussing where we've been, it is important to understand who we are. I met with Congressman Vicente Gonzalez to talk about South Texas, its place in today's society, what the region's about, and how perceptions held today may have originated long before the U.S. Civil War. For others that, that may see South Texas in the news and, and videos going viral, uh, but, but for you being down here all these years, what are what some of the biggest misconceptions of South Texas? Well, I think the misconceptions are ideas of, of uh, violence or unsafety in the region, which is obviously completely false based on our 34-year low uh, criminal uh, uh, status in, in this city right now. Along the South Texas border, you will find nearly 50,000 veterans with a tradition of service dating back to at least the U.S. Civil War. Every war from the Civil War to date, we've had veterans in this district. And I think that could be a misconception to folks across the country mm -hmm. uh, if you, we, when we talk about this region. Very patriotic region. It's a very patriotic region. So South Texas is, it is different. Uh, but it also, it is America. I was, I was sharing with uh, another person that, you know, you hear that America is the land of opportunity. Well, I, I see that every day uh, in the faces of the people of South Texas. What are some ways that uh, South Texas and our area, what are some ways that we exhibit uh, American values? Well, uh, we're a very welcoming uh, community to people from diverse backgrounds, whether it's racial, religious, uh, even our friends from the South, even these Central American kids who are showing up to our borders. And, and our community is not for open borders or illegal migration, but we still open our hearts uh, to these young kids and these families, and we try to see how we could be helpful. Let's drift back in time to 1848, the end of the Mexican-American War. The Rio Grande naturally became a boundary between the United States and Mexico. I met with historian Roseanne Garza at the Rio Grande on a levee which serves as an unofficial border of the U.S. and Mexico. Just after 1848, military forts were posted every 100 miles. Fort Brown in Brownsville, Ringo Barracks in Rio Grande City. 100 miles beyond that, was Fort McIntosh in Laredo. 
So um, not knowing what to expect, but at least knowing there was business happening. I think there was um, somewhat of an expectation and a hope that once they got here, they would find um, success, not only to live in peace and harmony amongst their neighbors, mm -hmm. um, but to at least start uh, building a, a home and a life for themselves. There were already Tejano and Mexican ranchers who were descendants of Spanish land grantees settling the area. It was a new frontier, mm. a new border region, um, not that devoid of any population because there were ranches that existed here before it became the international border, but um, there was uh, plenty of room for more people to come and stake their claim and, um, you know, contribute to a developing and growing economy. What people often forget, our border has always been an area of prosperity, adding to the economy and culture of the entire country. Well, the, the border has uh, historically been undervalued and, uh, and feared. Uh, and we do need to change perception of the border because, in fact, it was actually a place of great economic growth, of uh, great entrepreneurial spirit. And while South Texas as a region did enjoy economic growth and diversity at the time, slavery was still the law of the land. Mexico, on the other hand, had declared slavery illegal. There was freedom across that border. That, and sometimes they didn't even go that far. They just went to Matamoros. And many times they, they crossed back and forth. And many times they stayed in the areas in Brownsville. Escaped slaves traveled to cities such as Veracruz and Guerrero, Mexico. And thus one, you start seeing one after another, you start seeing this migration, this chain migration go across the border uh, that really goes into the end of the war. Uh, and then uh, they come back. But the idea of accept acceptance, the idea that there was already black communities there. While Mexico did hold a promise of freedom for many African Americans, migration into the area was not without controversy. Anglo colonists knew that Mexico had abolished slavery, but they didn't want to lose their property. So what they would do is, before they came to Texas, they would have their enslaved people sign contracts where they agreed to become servants for life. Wow. And so they had this contract signed by, signed by enslaved people. They reached Mexican territory and they would tell the Mexican government, oh, they're not slaves, they're servants, and here's their contracts. So the government will will translate them and notarize them. And they, it was a valid document. And that's one of the things that astounds me. Life in South Texas offered a chance to make a fresh start. Along the Texas-Mexico border, at that time, racism and prejudice were less of a concern. Between 1850 to about 1865, what you see is an emerging South Texas. Uh, the cities in, 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 in the valley have not really developed yet. South Texas at the time was a diverse community. Hard work equaled respect, no matter the color of your skin. And if the time ever came, escape was just a ferry ride across the Rio Grande into Mexico. It was very rural, so it was very easy to have uh, people uh, work within vaquero culture, uh, with Tejano culture, so there was diversity there. And being on the, on the cattle trail, many of these uh, Mexicanos uh, constantly came across white folks, uh, Germans, Irish, uh, uh, Indians, uh, Native people, so they were uh, uh, aware of the diversity that existed in their communities. This was an unsettled region, and hard-working men and women traveled here ready to leave the past behind and build their fortunes. You know, this was a great place for somebody to come and start fresh. Mm. When you think of back then, people were being pushed over the border in search of starting fresh uh, in a new land, and a new country. Um, we have the same situation today, but coming in the opposite direction. Right. Folks from Mexico are being pushed over the border to start uh, fresh in a, in a new land to them, in a new country, uh, because they're looking to create a better life for themselves. The yeah. river's always been here. In fact, you, you talk to folks who, it's a natural border. The center of the channel is the physical border between 
the United States and Mexico. Mm. But way back then, it was simply a river to be crossed. The ferry ride to freedom is the last leg of the Underground Railroad Southern Route. Escaping slaves who reached South Texas would reach the border and board waiting ferries to take the short ride across the Rio Grande into Mexico. The image that often comes to mind when we talk about the Underground Railroad is that of a daring journey north towards New York or Canada. Mostly lost to history is the trek undertaken by slaves who chose to escape south. For those willing to brave the treacherous Nueces Strip while dodging slave catchers, freedom came in the form of a final ferry ride across the Rio Grande into Mexico. So South Texas, while it may not have been uh, the easiest way due to the help that uh, slaves had in the North, it was the shortest route mm -hmm. to freedom. Yes, sir. Now, why did slaves decide to stay in America rather than crossing into Mexico? Well, it was what they encountered once they got down to South Texas. They uh, came across, if they were coming after 1857, when Nathaniel Jackson and his, um, his caravan of uh, mixed race families and uh, freed slaves came and settled on the land that we're standing on right now and settled Jackson Ranch, um, if they came across that family, they would have been uh, received with open arms, been steamboats going up and down the river and ferries going across the river to um, nearby Mexican town of Reynosa. Um, it was easy for those slaves to be shepherded across. So once they got here, they could decide whether they wanted to stay and live amongst the families here which some of them did, yeah. or they can continue on to Mexico and look for a respite there. South Texans accepted diversity as part of the cultural landscape. Settlers from northern areas of the United States worked the land side by side with escaped slaves, Tejanos, immigrants from Scotland, and other European countries. During that time, ethnicity didn't matter that much. If a person worked hard, built profit, and managed the land, they were accepted. It segregated less racist and more particularly less violent towards Africans, uh, African Americans, uh, where more likely uh, if you did something wrong in Waco, Texas, you'd be lynched. We don't have that here. Much like Mexico, it was easier for people of color to settle down here. Many soldiers who fought for the U.S. in the Mexican-American War remained in the region after the war, marrying and starting new lives with their families. While Texas as a whole still had a long way to go before it began accepting interracial couples, South Texas seemed to be in a world all its own. So there wasn't really danger uh, within marrying within within um, La, La Mexicano Tejano, Tejanos. Uh, the danger was married into white culture and into white into white society. South Texas is easy to cross. Modern highways, airports, and scenic back roads ensure a traveler can safely move through the landscape. Today. There are trails carved out so that people can come out, enjoy the terrain, and explore wildlife. But in the 1800s, this entire area was covered with cactus, thick brush, and mesquite. For those seeking freedom, there was no way around it. The only way was to fight through. The Nueces Strip is really significant to the history of South Texas, Texas, and even the United States. Following Santa Ana's defeat at San Jacinto in 1836, the Texans claimed the Rio Grande as the boundary. And then when Texas was annexed to the United States, the United States inherited the river as a boundary. Stretching about 150 miles, the Wild Horse Desert, as it is also called, was the area between the Nueces River and the Rio Grande. This already treacherous path was long and consisted of many dangers. 
and buried in that brush are tarantulas and scorpions and rattlesnakes and hardly anywhere to be seen and running water. Those seeking refuge by crossing the border into Mexico often got lost in this area without food, water, or shelter. Their path to freedom cut short. I think if the slaves could have stolen a horse in San Antonio or Gonzales or somewhere, uh, the escape could have been in a matter of days. But we have evidence that a lot of the slaves were trying to make this on foot. And some of them really got lost and wound up more out toward the Trans-Pecos than toward South Texas. But this would have been very daring. It would have been very risky, I think, just as some people today do not make it successfully into the United States in places like Southern Arizona and South Texas. I think a lot of slaves probably didn't make it into Mexico. So this would have been very different than crossing the Ohio River from Kentucky into Ohio. African Americans who knew the route would aid escaping slaves, but the sporadic nature of travel through the wild horse desert meant that finding guidance could be a challenge. So they were kind of like conductors in a way. Conductors in this railroad uh, or, or... Maria Hammock, a doctoral student at UT Austin, is one of the few experts in the southern route of the Underground Railroad. The journey is so treacherous even today that volunteers place water stations for dehydrating migrants crossing the Wild Horse Desert. I don't necessarily call it the Underground Railroad because that has a very specific meaning in U.S. history, in American slavery history. Mm -hmm. uh, you immediately think Harriet Tubman, mm -hmm. you know? And I'm, I haven't found the Harriet Tubman that that would help people go to Mexico, you see? But I'm looking for her mm -hmm. or him. And um, so it has a different connotation, so I'm trying to figure out a way to speak about this movement's south as a continuation of the Underground Railroad, but as a perhaps more um, individualized, because I do know that some of these individuals were making it down there on their own, mm -hmm. and they were seeking their own freedom, so they were self-liberating, as opposed to having um, some, you know, white abolitionists helping them right. across. Crossing the Nueces Strip, there were cactus, snakes, thorny mesquite trees. Those encounters were to be expected. But on the journey to freedom, there was another danger, slave catchers. You could be retrieved and come back. So uh, we do have instances where slaves go into Laredo and uh, uh, Benavides, uh, Captain Benavides actually, uh, during the Confederacy War, Confederacy War, actually hunts them and actually brings them back. Crossing into Mexico to capture escaped slaves could be considered an act of war. Despite that fact, slave catchers crossed the Rio Grande looking for a payday at the expense of each captured slave. One infamous slave catcher known to lurk the South Texas border was Rip Ford. Rip Ford is one of the more famous characters in Texas history and he served in two organizations that are still well known today. One of them was the Texas Rangers. He was the leader of one of the first four companies of Texas Rangers. During this time, Ford was the leader of one of the first of four companies of Texas Rangers. Even though there were some petitions from Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi asking Mexico um, to sign a treaty for the amicable retrieval of runaway slaves. Mm. Mexico, and I found these documents, um, uh, some of these documents in Mexico City a couple summers ago, and on one of the replies, I found one reply, but I'm assuming there were many replies to, to these many requests, saying, unfortunately, we cannot um, entertain your petition for this amicable treaty. The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 strengthened a previous law stating that every U.S. citizen was charged with the responsibility of actively capturing and returning escaped slaves. The law went on to state that any person caught helping an escaped slave could be charged and jailed. 
The Fugitive Slave Act of 1850 additionally stated that law enforcement officials were bound by law to arrest people suspected to be runaway slaves. Being discovered by slave catchers had life-threatening consequences. There was a heartbreaking story that I recently found of this individual, this uh, Mexican man, who was living somewhere in um, South Texas with this uh, woman who was enslaved by this uh, Anglo colonist. And he, they, they lived there for a couple of years, but I guess at one point they decided, he decided that they were gonna run away and go to Mexico. And they did, a, and they were caught, and he was lynched on the spot, and she was returned to her master. Wow. I had to ask, with all the dangers connected to crossing the Nueces Strip and avoiding slave catchers, why not just follow the more established route north? Well, it's a long ways from East Texas, where most of the black population is, to the, to the Rio Grande. But those slaves seeking freedom had no alternative. The notion of the fact that slavery was already abolished in Mexico. When, when by, did that happen? That happened in 1829 by then president of Mexico, Vicente Guerrero, who was, uh, who can be categorized as Afro-Mestizo, mm. so with African-American blood and Native American blood wow. uh, running through his veins. Um, there was, uh, you know, there was not an interest in holding slaves in Mexico. So the slaves knew that if you got over the border into Mexico, you could be free. Um, they knew that the river was there, and if they just cross that river, they get into Mexico and find their freedom. But once in South Texas, there were families willing to aid in that final ferry ride to freedom. And it totally makes sense that the Underground Railroad went through this region because there was a way to get here. Slaves knew how to get down to the river from uh, other plantations up in northern Texas and northern eastern Texas. And there were people down here that were sympathetic to their cause. Family commitment, hard work, and individuality. Those are qualities associated with Texas. We see those traits in people living along the border today. And we will soon see the value of family loyalty is deeply rooted in the past. It was Congressman Gonzalez who pointed out to me the critical role family plays in the lives of South Texans. Well, I think in this community, uh, family is very important. And families are tight-knit and pe people help each other up. And uh, I think family is the most important thing in life. And it certainly was for me. I come from an uh, immigrant mother from Mexico and a, a U.S. veteran father. So uh, even in that sense, there was diversity within a Latino household. The value of family is a tradition extending back to pre-Civil War South Texas. Extraordinary families like the Jacksons and the Webbers not only built the land, but were critical to the southern route of the Underground Railroad. Well, the, the main character is Nathaniel Jackson, who is um, the patriarch of the family, the son of a plantation owner out of Georgia. But then he developed his own plantation in Alabama. And uh, it is my theory that while he was growing up on his plantation in Georgia, he was playing as a child with Matilda Hicks, who was the child of a slave on his father's plantation. Mm. And, uh, and then once those slaves, uh, those slave children got to be a certain age, then they were uh, taken out of the playground with the plantation owner's white children and put into the fields to work with the rest of the slaves. Roseanne's theory is Matilda and Nathaniel never lost their affection for one another. But growing up on the same plantation, they were in different worlds. Matilda would become an adult, marry, and have three children with another man. But... But they could not deny their love, and they uh, um, had, uh, you know, they created their union. And uh, he is remembered through the family folklore and clearly through the way that this uh, ranch compound has developed. He, he brought with him those seven families in five covered wagons 
with, they were all mixed race unions wow. and many of them, and there were 17 freed slaves among the population that he brought with them. Leading a caravan of mixed race families, the Jacksons were most likely headed to Mexico to join a colony of escaped slaves and other mixed race families. I think because they landed here at the river, they're Americans, they speak English. Mm. They also worship the, they set up the Protestant slash Methodist church here. Uh, I think they just decided to stay here because they liked it. They were happy with the terrain. Mexico is mostly a Catholic country and they didn't speak the language. And they thought, you know what, this is probably far enough. <laughs> the Jacksons built up ranch land along the Rio Grande River and found safety, family happiness, and riches on the border. Their faith pushed them to seek out more, though. Within years, Nathaniel Jackson established the area's first Protestant church. While we know for a fact the church was built, family and local lore claim the Jacksons were involved in more clandestine dealings. Many believe the Jacksons were central figures in assisting escaped slaves to freedom in Mexico by crossing the Rio Grande on their licensed ferry boats. To escape persecution and discrimination, this was before an an emancipation. Mm. They came over here to escape that, thinking that it would be better here in Texas. The original plan was for them to go into Mexico to Tampico. Mm. Ramiro Ramirez is a local rancher and a bit of a historian. More importantly, he is a descendant of Nathaniel and Matilda Jackson. The land we are standing on is part of the Jackson Ranch, land owned by Ramiro's family and was first worked by Nathaniel Jackson and his cohort of mixed race families. But they knew that in Mexico, 95% or maybe even more were Roman Catholic. So uh, growing up, did you hear stories about uh, your family being involved in the Underground Railroad? Oh, yes. My grandmother and I were very, very, very close. And she would tell me uh, how they would come in wagon trains. And every time we saw a movie with cowboys or Indians or whatever, they, she would say, my ancestors came in those that's the way they traveled. Wow. You know, and so they got here. So uh, she would tell me that that this is a place of refuge, mm. that they could have the, the uh, this could be like an underground railroad for the African American. Mm. And they would stay here as long as they wanted to. And they had a choice to go into Mexico or to stay here. And some of them stayed. And so they went to Mexico, already knowing Spanish. Wow. So they were able to assimilate fairly well. Wow. Now, now, why do you think your family uh, put their lives and their livelihoods at risk? I mean, knowing that the dangers involved in the persecution, why was your family uh, willing to get involved? And knowing what discrimination was and, and, and prosecution and killing mm. was, he, he already felt that he was a victim to that and he wanted to help the people that some way he escaped it, he wanted other people to escape it too. Wow. And so he, he housed them, he fed them, took care of them. And then whenever there was a ferry that would pass by the Rio Grande, they would look for moments at a time to where the ferry was here and then they would cross them. A few years before the Jacksons arrived, the Webbers began ranching on the Rio Grande. Located only a few miles east of what would become Jackson Ranch, the two families had much in common. The Weber family saw this area as an area of, 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 of safety. Roseanne gave me a tour of the Weber family cemetery, located on land still owned by the family. The Weber's journey to South Texas and passion to help mixed race families arriving at the border are central to the story of an emerging South Texas. So Roseanne, who was John Weber? Well, um, 
When he arrived in uh, Austin with the uh, Stephen F. Austin's Austin Colony of 300 to settle uh, the area of Texas upon the invitation of the Mexican government, um, he came as a single man. Uh, he was a veteran of uh, the War of 1812, and uh, when he settled in Weberville, well, actually, it was ended up being called Weber's Prairie, uh, he met with, uh, or met the next door neighbor's slave, Sylvia Hector. Even though Weber married Sylvia Hector in 1827 and had children with her, she was still a slave. In order for Weber to be with her and their children, he had to purchase their freedom. That freedom was purchased in 1834. And by that time, the family included John, Sylvia, and three children. So he had to buy all of their freedom. Yes, yeah. And so, yes, because if you're born to a, um, a slave woman or a slave man, you are the baby is considered a slave. Even if the father is white and the mother is black, the baby is considered a slave. So they were there. free basically trying to live in yes. secret. Yeah, well, they were living out in the open um, and, and getting along with their neighbors just fine until population started to grow. And then this Fugitive Slave Act came into play. And so they decided um, that they would uh, come to Mexico. Weber already had a great deal of experience traversing the Nueces Strip. His work as a tobacco trader forced him to cross the difficult terrain on a regular basis. I'm not quite sure what drew him all the way down here, um, but he knew he would be safe and his family would be safe in Mexico. Settling along the Rio Grande River in South Texas, the Webbers were able to quickly set down roots and become a part of the local community. Their ranch was also a stop uh, in conjunction with the Jackson Ranch, uh, a few miles to the west of us here. Uh, as a stop on the, on the Underground Railroad because simply they were a mixed race family. Sylvia Hector was an emancipated slave. Why is it that we are just now hearing about the Underground Railroad headed south? That's a very good question. I've been trying to figure that out for the past five years. No book length manuscript has been produced on these histories. I do know that um, also in, in the borderlands area on the Mexico side and on the Texas side, uh, the narratives of how they want to portray the history has been, uh, it's very uh, traditional. They safeguard those narratives mm. on both sides. Um, in Mexico, we don't really learn about uh, our black roots. And in, the, in Texas, if you know, uh, the way you learn about uh, Texas Black Roots is very different from what documents uh, tell us. Mm -hmm. Maria attributes limited information about this route to the lack of education on the subject and even fewer academic resources. And I'm hoping that um, when I finish my dissertation, my book will serve not just for a book in the United States, but also in Mexico to educate about um, this transnational movements from the United States in the 19th century. Well, the history really is left to the, the folklore of the oral history stories that are passed down through the generations of family members of the Jacksons, the Webbers, the Singletaries, the Brewsters, um, the Rutledges. Uh, just by the very nature of an underground railroad, it is a secret clandestine, clandestine uh, event or a series of events. So nobody's writing down, oh, this is exactly the spot. There are no maps right. available. There are no, um, you know, no records in the courthouse that, oh yes, the Underground Railroad passed through here. It was a secret event or a secret series of events. So nobody really kept any physical records of it. We would like to tell an even more complete story <laughs> if we could find records, but there are no physical records. So we are doing the best we can with what we have. So we think that this Underground Railroad existed. Exactly where and who was running it, we don't know. Uh, there are some secessionist newspapers that are blaming it on Tejanos, 
but we don't know that for sure. While the Underground Railroad and mixed race families helped build the economy and culture of South Texas through the 1800s, nothing could shield the area from events about to shake the United States at its very foundation. The, the period from 1861 to 1865 in South Texas was known by many people, not as the Civil War, but as the Cotton Times. And to many of these individuals, it was a period of economic boom. The Rio Grande Valley played a critical role in the transporting of cotton. Communities all along the border prospered during the war as thousands of bales of cotton were transported across the river into Mexico. Well, uh, I suppose that if we're looking at legacy, this entire episode was what really brought the Civil War to South Texas. While not everyone shared in the wealth, those who did took all they could during the cotton times. Making money from first Confederate and later Union forces, these men risked family names, fortunes, and lives, all in the name of profit. Two of those men are Mifflin Kennedy and Richard King, names still synonymous with Texas today. Mifflin Kennedy was the partner of Captain Richard King, and the two of them together had managed to dominate the steamboat trade up and down the Rio Grande prior to the war. After the war between the U.S. and Mexico ended with the signing of the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, both men developed more substantial interests on the northern bank of the Rio Grande. A third person of interest during this time is Santos Benavides a slave catcher who during the time of the Civil War turned profiteer. Santos Benavides in Laredo rose to become a colonel in the Confederate Army, which means that he is the highest ranking officer in the Confederate Army, highest ranking Tejano officer, and could have become a general had he been able to fill up one of his regiments at the end of the war. When searching historical archives, the motivation that moved King, Kennedy, and Benavides forward during the Civil War? I think the almighty dollar was very, very important during the Civil War. And you may have had people who were very, very loyal to the South, but you had a lot of people who were more interested in making money than they were in secession. In 1865, the Civil War came to an end. And with that, so did the Cotton Times. The emancipation that followed brought an end to the Underground Railroad. However, the paths that it blazed were later followed by smugglers taking goods into and out of Mexico. We assume that those same paths are still being used today by both immigrants seeking freedom and current day smugglers. Those routes were actually uh, blazed, opened, discovered uh, by Native Americans long before any of this happened. Um, we have clear records of uh, Indian groups coming from Mexico into this region to go to Sal del Rey, for example, to collect salt. So when these people were coming down from Alabama and other places to take up residence in South Texas, they followed those same routes because those were the only known ways of getting down here. Times and situations were complex. Men who accepted or were part of mixed race families also worked for the Southern cause, buying and selling cotton. Mifflin Kennedy, John King, Santos Benavides, and Rip Ford how do we view these men today? Were they heroes who built South Texas or villains working for profit at the cost of human life? An example of just how complex the times were can be found in the life of Abraham Rutledge. Rutledge, a man married to an emancipated slave, became a South Texas landowner, then found profit and adventure working for the Confederacy. Uh, Abraham Rutledge was a um, one of the Rutledge family was one of the families that came uh, with Nathaniel Jackson uh, in the covered wagons 
Abraham Rutledge was a white man married to Nancy Smith Jackson, who was the stepdaughter of Nathaniel Jackson, daughter of Matilda Hicks from her first marriage. So she was either all black, like Matilda Hicks was, or she was mixed race, married to a white man, mm. and traveling here and um, setting up their home and their life and their livelihood here. Later, during the Civil War, in late 1863, the Confederate Army came through, looking for skilled horsemen and vaqueros to help patrol the Rio Grande. The Confederate Army came through through Captain William Thomas's company of partisan rangers and offered a horse, a rifle, a saddle, boots, thing and, and, and protection mm -hmm. for these ranchers during this very tumultuous time in the US in, in the US history during the American Civil War. So those ranch owners were like, okay, you're offering it, I'll take it, they mustered in. Mm. The interesting part about Abraham Rutledge's desire to muster into the Confederacy was he was married to a mixed race woman. Right. <laughs> and so if the Confederacy is uh, part of their structure is to protect their right to hold slaves, right if that's one of the things that they're fighting for. And this family clearly and, and, pushed against that. And this family was escaping uh, discrimination. Uh, when they left uh, Alabama in 1857, um, you know, the, the Fugitive Slave Act had come into play in 1850. Slaves freed, freed slaves or emanci already emancipated slaves were being recaptured and resold back wow. into slavery. While Rutledge did not agree with the Confederate cause, an obligation to protect his family drove Rutledge to muster into the Confederate Army. To this day, Abraham Rutledge's headstone stands as a reminder that Abraham Rutledge mustered into the Confederate Army. So why did these men join the Confederate cause? Was it for the cause, love of money, or family obligation? For most, it was a combination of reasons, but profit always seems to come out at the top of the list. Certainly the prominent American families, such as the Kings and the Kennedys, who participated in this trade, thought that they were being loyal Confederates by providing this service. Um, however, they did not object to collecting the profits. To be quite honest, I don't think these guys cared one way or the other what race anybody was. Um, well, all they cared about was their business interests. Uh, and in that respect, they were very egalitarian. Um, so sure, you know, the fact, that, the fact that these people were willing to do just about anything to move their businesses forward uh, left them open to any possibility that would work in their economic best interest. But the histories of enslaved and free blacks across this frontier has been largely ignored. We hear about, you know, black, uh, brown migrants who come from Central America on a day-to-day -day basis on the news, right? We, we know this because it's very present. But the other history is not known. Mm -hmm. And I think it needs to be known so that we can understand the, the, this history more fully because it is a, a, a the shared history of the United States and Mexico, and it has shaped policy, it has shaped uh, Mexico-U.S. relations, and it definitely has shaped the border that we have today and the problems that we have today. Mm -hmm. The close of the U.S. Civil War was not the final chapter of diversity and inclusion for South Texas. As the Civil War concluded, African-American soldiers fighting on the side of the North was stationed all along the border. At the end of the Civil War, um, the United States Army wanted to send troops down to guard the Rio Grande Valley, uh, the border with Mexico, which was having a civil war. And they chose African-American soldiers that were in the 25th Corps. And amongst those were four regiments from Kentucky. The troops known at the time as the United States Colored Troops, or USCT, 
came to South Texas to prevent former Confederates from restarting the war. The troops also were the first line of defense against bandit raids and to stop the Mexican Revolution from spreading north across the river. These U.S. color troops and mixed race families leave behind a legacy that is still recognized today with the annual Juneteenth observations here in nearby Edinburgh, Texas. South Texas has been an engine for change in the U.S. for the better ever since Spanish colonization. Ethnicity and race are key factors for this success in creating a diverse population here along the southern tip of the United States. Remember, prior to the Civil War, the U.S. Army served as protectors and law of the region. During the chaos of the war, security forces meant to protect families along the border disappeared, leaving residents to fend for themselves. So when post-war African-American troops began fortifying the area against bandit raids and other dangers, South Texans were quick to welcome them. While family names like King, McAllen, Benavides, and a few others forever become connected to Texas lore, many important historical details have been lost. It's interesting, the, the mixed race heritage um, that was so much a part of the story during the Civil War period got lost in history. Um, a lot of the descendants of those families don't even acknowledge uh, the, that they're part African American. Um, those that do acknowledge it point out that they're, they're really not conscious of it. Uh, it doesn't affect their everyday behavior and most of them grew up speaking Spanish. While the history of the Underground Railroad's southern route is left mostly untold, Descendants of South Texas early mixed race families take pride in their heritage. About South Texas and, and you being a small business owner yourself, uh, do, do you see the entrepreneurial spirit down here? Or? I do. Okay. People are traders. Yeah. Uh, people buy and sell and go across the border. And, and, and we've been doing this for centuries. Uh, even way before uh, the North American Free Trade Agreement, people were going across the border to buy sugar or to buy, you know, uh, cattle or to sell cattle, and as they did um, in our side of the border, and that's been, we've been trading with Mexico uh, for generations before the North American Free Trade Agreement existed. If we were to get rid of NAFTA tomorrow, I guarantee <laughs> you that we will continue to trade with Mexico. We'll find a way to do. It. We will find a way because we always have. Mm. I think that the timing is perfect when we look at all that's going on in the world. Uh, for, for, for this history to get out and, and the truth to get out, uh, finally. Texas has this history of diversity that has been largely ignored. Mm -hmm. But today, you know, we, thinks, we hope things are changing. For instance, this past month, the Texas State Board of Education approved for the first time to change its TEKS, the, the teaching standards, so that students in Texas at last learn the real reason for the Civil War. Wow, in, tw in 2018. In 2018. Wow. That is a big win for any educator, for any historian. And I think a lot of it had to do with how my grandmother would talk about the importance of being who you are. Mm -hmm. Race being one thing, ethnicity being something else. Race is who you are. Can't do anything about it. That's who you are. Ethnicity, well, that can change depending on the, the, the religion or depending on your customs and your values. And she would always talk about that. You don't lose that, she would say to me. Mm -hmm. And teach this to your children. Tell them, tell them where they came from. And this is where I came from. My, my parents are here, my grandparents are my great, great grandparents are here. And so we've kept this alive for them. Wow. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mr. Ramiro. I appreciate that. You're welcome, my friend. Yes, thank, thank you. you God much. bless you.